Yeah, look, um, as a national facilitator, I was heavily involved early on when these planning approaches were being developed. Um, my role, I guess, was to bring a range of best practice from around the country um, and just give people a bit of exposure to you know, similar landscapes where different things are working, uh, how people can get involved, um, getting them to take more of an active part in decision making about the control that's being used. Um, there's a lot of areas within this region um, where there was a lot of uncleared land on, on private land, um, a lot of forest and bushland that was probably not being treated because the program was focused on the state land. So, it was really about getting people to look at it as a, as we call it, you know, that nil tenure approach, getting rid of who owns what and actually looking at the landscape and delivering adequate control across that area. And part of that was about setting up these um, community boating programs, um, providing and, and moving the focus from away from purely dogs to, to a land management approach, um, setting up the best wall, best land groups that we've now got in these areas. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, wild dog management and fox management was just part of on-farm management. Wild dog and fox management is part of that. So, yeah, I was very, I guess, um, heavily involved early on in the piece, um, and I'm back now to see. You know, I work very closely with the coordinators for the the baiting programs and then with Australian Wool Innovation. So, I guess um, I really just wanted to catch up with the guys here and, and see how things are progressing, and um, you know, see whether what we've instigated is actually helping them out. Which, um, judging by the, the reduced stock losses and the, and the lower number of dogs and um, I guess the lower amount of angst amongst the producers, they're much more comfortable with the program now. They seem to have a hell of a lot more confidence in the fact that there's a lot more being done and, and if they report on an incident that things are actually going to be dealt with. Um, so, you know, that, that's all we can hope for. It's a type of landscape where um, dogs are always going to be an issue and, and all we can do is make sure we've got adequate programs in place to manage their impacts uh, when they arise. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with the way things are going and uh, you know, working with these stakeholders and seeing them adopting some of this best practice and, and getting the outcomes that they desire is, um, has been quite rewarding. Look, I think the future of the project is quite healthy. Um, we're now seeing stakeholders uh, more involved and more engaged with the department, so that's something that was lacking when we first um, got involved. There, was, there wasn't much communication between the stakeholders and, and the department, so there's a, a lot of frustration about what was actually happening. So. Um, the legacy from that is that the fact that you know people now are involved, they've got a much better relationship with the wild dog controllers, uh, much better relationship with the managers of the program. So, from that perspective, I see that relationship being ongoing. Um, we've also seen the introduction of aerial baiting and, and the fact that the current government maintained aerial baiting because they could see the value and the benefit from a current national best practice point of view. So, um, I think that's, you know the legacies of that is that you know we've got these programs hopefully now that are built. Uh, and will be ongoing. Uh, it's just about maintaining that um, that ongoing management, not becoming complacent, as we see in a lot of parts of the country. That when the issue is being managed and the impacts aren't as great, um, the focus isn't on it. So we'd actually see people start to reduce the amount of control they're delivering. Um, so really, the, the the approach from here now is to maintain that that communication, keep people involved, um, and make sure that people are still applying control. Um, it may be less because the impacts are, are, are minimised, but we still need people to apply control consistently in areas where we know those baits are going to be taken or that those traps are going to be used so that we don't get back to the point where we have a massive build-up of wild dogs in the background and then all of a sudden get a, a wave of attacks. So it's got to be ongoing and it has to be more and more targeted as we go forward. Well, the complacency one's a big challenge. We're already seeing that. We've already seen reductions in people participating in, in the coordinator baitings and the community baiting programs because of the reduced impact. Um, that's going to be a challenge, um, keeping those people motivated to, to be involved. Um, I think ongoing, you know, we're always going to get problem dogs. Um, so making sure that we've got reporting in place, communication in place, um, and a response time that's adequate to, to respond to those attacks is going to be an ongoing challenge. And it's more it's more around communication and, and engagement than it is about dog control uh, and making sure people are comfortable that you know the program is in place delivering um, and giving them the confidence to make sure that if they have an issue they can report it um, and, and the response is, is adequate. So. Oh look, well, in the past it was managed because we had wild dog management plans and associations and groups on each side um, that both undertook their control and spoke to each other. Um, we've got to get back to that. I think that relationship's probably diminished in the last few years. Um, 
in Queensland, for instance, we've got similar examples where we've now got the, the wild dog control groups either side of the border now working collectively as a one group. Uh, in parts of the country, we've now also linked out further west. All of the coordinated baiting programs now flowed south through into New South Wales. So it's one big program from virtually the Gulf right through to Broken Hill. So it, it can be done, and, and I think we've done a lot of work over the years improving that communication through both my role nationally and our National Wild Dog Group. Um, we've now got our Wild Dog, uh, National Wild Dog Action Plan and that once again has brought all of those stakeholders back together. So um, I think at a higher level we've got the organisational capacity to manage it. We now have to get the, the organisation and the structures in place at, at that local level so that those guys have got the confidence to contact each other and work collectively as a group just as we're seeing through the Tambo Valley here now, that all these groups work collectively as one. Um, we just have to get at a local scale across those border areas, getting those groups working collectively as one as well. Um, yeah, they're the difficult patches and we've got plenty of those now. We've got dogs moving into what we call peri-urban areas where we've got lots of lifestyle blocks, um, far less production, there's a different focus. Um, nationally, we've sort of worked on those areas, trying to raise the awareness and bring the, those Wild dog impacts to the attention of those stakeholders. Um, the impacts on, on wildlife and biodiversity are quite high in some of those areas. Um, but it really is going to require you know, a fairly in-depth targeted campaign of education uh, and supporting those groups because uh, many of the control tools available to rural producers aren't available or usable in those landscapes. So, um, yeah, it's a difficult one in those landscapes. It's going to take a lot of work with the public land managers because they're often the larger holdings where we can deliver some of the current controls. So that has to be a coordinated approach there as well. Um, but yeah, it's very intensive. Um, we'll take a bit of work if dogs start to cause impacts in those landscapes. Uh, we've got significant issues uh, in similar landscapes in Grafton, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, the outskirts of Brisbane, the Gold Coast. Um, we've got a, a project at the moment, Perry Urban Wild Dog Project, running in South East Queensland. We've got dogs living. Uh, on the road verges between the Bruce Highway. Um, in and amongst townships we've got uh, major impacts of wild dogs on, on koala populations um, around Brisbane and stuff like that too. So we're forcing um, koalas into you know, fragmented habitats that the dogs are quite happy to utilise and, and increase in conflict and opportunities for being preyed on in those landscapes. So um, it's very difficult in those areas to get traction um, but it's really about concerted education an awareness campaign and then looking at what options are available in those limited circumstances.